Okay, great. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us um, for the participants and also for the speakers. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. We feel like this is a very important webinar. Um, it's going to have a lot of great information and we really appreciate your time today. Um, so a couple housekeeping items, uh, please make sure that you're on mute unless you are speaking. Um, and also, if you do have any questions as we go, please place those in the chat and we will address those at the end of the webinar. Um, and then the session is also being recorded. So um, I will put that disclosure closure in as well. Um, we also have a webinar disclaimer. So please take a minute to just read over uh, the disclaimer before we get started. Great, and then um, our objective and speaker overview. So um, this webinar is to provide information on financing, ITC credits, rebates and incentives to help you create a pathway to make solar um, possible for your nonprofit. Um, and today's speakers, we have uh, Jeff Kodish, who is a volunteer at Harsham, um, it, which is a faith-based nonprofit. And he will be speaking about his project and also lessons learned on that. Um, and then we have uh, Nick, Perugini, am I saying that right? <laughs> uh, from Solaris Energy. And then Heath um, McKay from McKinistry. Um, Tom Hardy with Partners for Clean Environment, um, talking about rebates and incentives through Boulder County. And then Thomas Polish with TAP Synergy Networks, um, who's providing a legal aspect um, re regarding solar development, renewable energy technology, and equipment. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started and turn it over to Jeff Kodish. Good morning, everyone. Amber, thanks for setting this up. Um, I, I'm really happy to be here with such a great group of panelists with such deep experience uh, in helping nonprofits and faith-based groups uh, go solar. So what I'd like to do is kind of just give a little bit of background about Har Hashem and then kind of tell the story about how Har Hashem ended up going solar. And then we'll chat a little bit about some lessons learned in the process. So Har Hashem um, was established in 1965. It's the oldest operating synagogue in Boulder. And our vision includes this concept of uh, tikkun olam, which is a Hebrew word that means repairing the world. Um, so the, the solar project that we did was kind of in line with this mission that we have of tikkun olam. And I think that really all uh, faith-based groups and all nonprofits, to some extent, share that same mission right? Um, we're doing this, we're in this nonprofit world, we're in this faith-based world uh, because we believe in, in, in doing good. Um, so the electric power sector is, you know, one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions um, and switching from, you know, power from the grid to power from the sun help Har Hashem kind of take a step forward in solving the climate change problem in a way that was real and tangible. And so my hope here is that you'll gain some tools today to help you help your nonprofits and help your faith-based uh, organizations um, do, do the same thing. I wanna kind of quickly mention that, you know, the, the solar project isn't the only thing that Har Hashem has been doing to address environmental issues. Um, the first thing that we did was address the efficiency um, of our electric use and, and gas use in our building. I think any kind of hard, any, any nonprofit, anyone who's trying to address these issues really needs to start with kind of the efficiency uh, piece of it. We also installed some uh, software to help monitor and, and manage our electric use. Um, we, we host an annual symposium on spirituality and the environment. And I'd encourage everyone to get on our website at Har Hashem and and, and join us for that, uh, that, that, that symposium. It's, it's always very interesting. And then we have a green team that gets together and kind of works on broader uh, environmental issues. So with that background, um, I'd like to kind of get into uh, the story about how Har Hashem uh, built our, our PV system. Um, I've been a member of the synagogue for about 20 years. And about five years ago, uh, my friend who was president of the synagogue at the time, asked me to kind of step up to the plate and do some volunteer work. Well, his vision of the volunteer work that he was looking for and my vision 
weren't exactly the same. He wanted me to be on the fundraising committee to call people and say, hey, are you paying your fair share? And that had like zero interest for me. Uh, but I had been thinking it would be great for Har Hashem to install solar. Um, I've owned a couple houses and it's been wonderful for me personally, and it was really easy to do. And so I thought, well, I'm not interested in being on the fundraising committee, but you know, Greg, what do you think about working with me to get the synagogue to install solar? And uh, Greg's day job was an atmospheric scientist. So he quickly realized that this was a good thing and a good thing for, for Har Hashem to do. So it was easy to get, uh, to get his support. Uh, but, but kind of what I learned in the process is that um, it's kind of more complicated um, when you're dealing with a, a nonprofit to kind of go through that process of getting solar installed on your building. And it was more, more, more complicated for a couple of reasons, right? First of all, if you're a business or you're an individual, the decision-making process internally is, is simpler. Nonprofits are run by boards and you know, it can be complex to kind of get everyone on the board um, on the same page. And then the second reason it was more complicated is that a big financial driver for these solar projects is the investment tax credit and depreciation. So businesses can reduce the cost of their solar by these investment tax credits and depreciation, but nonprofits, it's a little bit more difficult for them to take advantage of that. And this is something that I kind of, I, I didn't fully grasp when I took, took on this project. So I started looking into this and kind of researching how uh, nonprofits were able to kind of cost effectively install solar with this tax code that really is geared towards businesses and not, not nonprofits. And you know, what I learned is that a common way that folks did this was a, a, a arrangement called a, a power purchase agreement or a solar services agreement. And basically what this is, is that a group of investors who can take advantage of the, the tax um, code, right? Who can, who can take advantage of the investment tax credit and the depreciation will buy and build the system, install it on the, the property, the, the property of the nonprofit or faith-based group. They'll take that tax credit, they'll take that depreciation, and then they'll charge the nonprofit or the faith-based group for electricity, just so from the nonprofit's view, instead of paying the utility, you're paying the, um, you, you know, the, the owner of the system that enters into the PPA with you. Um, and I thought this was kind of a cool approach, right? It gave nonprofits an ability to, you know, kind of be on equal ground with, uh, with regular businesses. So I started thinking about how to do this. Um, and I'm, I'm, a, I've been a, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. So I thought, well, we can just set up our own investment group and get members of the synagogue to invest in this. Um, and you know, the synagogue will pay this investment group to do it. And we ultimately decided not to go down that path um, for a few reasons. I mean, I, I think that can be a very viable path, uh, but for our group, we decided not to do it for a few reasons, right? Number one is we were kind of concerned about the conflict of interest issues. We didn't want some members thinking, hey, why are these other people making money on this project? Number two is that in order to, to take advantage of these tax benefits, it takes a very specific type of, of investor. And so we'd have to kind of get into people's finances and figure out whether they um, kind of had this thing called passive income that allowed them to, to take advantage of the investment tax credit. So ultimately um, what we decided is we were better off working with a separate company that did this stuff all the time. And that's where, um, we got introduced to uh, Solaris through the, the contractor Namaste that we were working with. And Solaris is a Fort Collins based group that um, basically does this, right? They, they buy and build systems and then they enter into power purchase agreements with customers to, to um, you know, buy the electricity. And so they're, they're kind of mission aligned with ours. They're very focused on addressing climate change and supporting the community. And so, you know, for us, it became pretty clear that this was the right path. And now just a, a quick moment of full disclosure. Um, I like the folks at Solaris so much that I ended up working for them part-time. So I'm now their part-time uh, general counsel, but I'm trying to put my Har Hashem hat on as I go through this process and 
and tell you about, um, about our, our, our journey. Um, so the project itself um, is a, a 52.5 kilowatt system. It provides about 75% uh, of the electric needs of Har Hashem. It cost about $135,000. Um, we financed it through some great programs that the city and county provide, and folks are going to talk about that as well, um, and a generous donation from someone uh, from our synagogue. And so when we threw all that together and approached Solaris, we were able to kind of enter into a PPA that allowed us to pay less than what we were paying to the utility um, for our, our electricity. Um, so it ended up being a, a great win-win um, for us. The agreement essentially has a provision that after six years, the synagogue can purchase the system uh, for a reduced rate. And I think we'll probably use that as a fundraising opportunity to, to, to do that. So I'm, I wanna quickly touch on a few lessons learned here and then I'm gonna pass off the, the discussion to Nick. Um, number one is your nonprofit or your faith-based group really needs an internal champion. Someone who can organize this stuff, work internally to get the support they need and work effectively and efficiently with the contractors and with the financing partners. Cause these folks, you know, it's hard to work with nonprofits. So the easier you make it for them, the smoother it's going to be for everyone. Number two, reach out to the folks at the County and the city. They've got a wealth of information and they're here to support you, right? They believe in solving the climate change problem. And they believe that helping faith-based groups and nonprofits is part of that. And then the final lesson learned for me has to do with a little perspective on money. And maybe this is just because I've been spending a lot of time thinking about money recently, but we were laser focused on making sure that our program, our system was saving the synagogue money. We wanted to be fiscally responsible and we wanted to be environmentally responsible. And we spent a lot of time working on that fiscal responsibility part. And it can get a little complicated to get down to the penny and make sure that this thing is really saving money. So my kind of reflection over time is, yeah, we've all got to be fiscally responsible. If you're on a nonprofit or faith-based group, you've got an obligation to be fiscally responsible. But be careful that that doesn't drive you too much. At the end of the day, we do things every day that are good for the environment and good for the community and might not be the absolute best thing to do financially. So just kind of keep that in mind as you go through the process. Um, so I wanna, I wanna end by um, having the honor of introducing Nick, um, our next speaker. So, you know, I met Nick when we started negotiating the PPA. And uh, since that time, um, many, many years ago, um, we've become friends. Nick has become a mentor to me uh, about all things solar, and he's kind of my boss now too, um, for away a and a part time. So Nick, um, Nick works with Solaris, and I'll hand it over to you now, Nick, to um, to talk about this issue from your perspective. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you're go ahead and probably much too generous. Jeff touched on a lot of points. Um, I'm going to want to skim some of the early ones on how you can prepare yourself. But of course, like most webinars, I'll start with a shameless plug. Um, next slide, please. So Solaris Energy was actually founded as a nonprofit in 2008 um, with the mission of helping other nonprofits profits fund their solar projects. We restructured as a for-profit in 2014 to expand our reach, now we can serve both nonprofits, organizations of faith, and businesses alike. Non, um, we do a lot of work for schools, municipalities, um, those that like to lead by example, environmentally conscious, while also you know, being fiscally respons responsible and saving on their electric bills. The core of our business, and there's multiple options of funding, so this is where we focused. Um, I want to be agnostic in that because no matter what method an organization of faith or nonprofit uses, utilizes to go solar, I just want to see them happen. For one of the former hats that I wore was uh, the chair of the Colorado Solar and Storage Association. So that's the trade association for solar and storage in the Colorado. So I am a big advocate. So whatever method you choose, there's steps you can take to be prepared 
to make that process smooth and easy for all the other partners that you work with, which often will lead to the best rates. Um, the power purchase agreement is the core of our business. Um, we utilize actually what's called the solar services agreement. Essentially, it's the same document with some legal changes, which makes it more versatile across most states because the power purchase agreement alone is not legal in every state or every utility. In Colorado, it is, except for, I believe, Holy Cross um, in the mountains. It's the only utility that doesn't allow them. Um, we have over 80 operational project sites, 50 of which we still own and operate, including nine for organizations of faith and probably about 30 that are nonprofits, genuine nonprofits. That encompasses about 10 megawatts, I call them bragawatts, across eight states. Um, our team is small, dynamic, nimble, creative, and collaborative. We want to work with all the parties involved, and there are many cooks in the kitchen sometimes to make sure that a deal works only when it works for everybody. Um, we have both internal and external funding sources at this point in time. Next slide, please. This is the important part. The, the speakers to come are gonna have um, lots more information in the detail and in the weeds. But when you're starting to explore, what do you have to do first? We tend to jump right to the physical, like what fits and how much power can it create and how much can we save? But that's not gonna finance your project. So, if you're preparing, and most of you here probably have um, closed on a loan for a house or a car or both, um, and you know the process, there's a lot of hoops to jump through in the beginning. The more ducks you have in a row, the less painful that process is. So some of the things to be prepared with, which I think we all can admit, and I've been involved in many nonprofits, we can get a little sloppy with sometimes, but having your organizational formation documents at hand, at the ready for sharing, this is kind of part of what's necessary for a credit review. You know, your articles of incorporation or if it's partner agreements, um, any letters from the IRS about your nonprofit 501c3 status or other C something status. Um, if there's a fictitious name statement, again, all organizational documents. And in those, and in either a council or board meeting that you might have, make sure it's a verification. Who has the signing authority? or the negotiation authority. I could tell you more than a few stories where we were literally um, a day away from signing contracts that people had worked on for a couple of months. And then it was realized, well, that person doesn't even have the authority to sign this contract. Seems like a simple thing, but make sure that's, that's all known. Take that vote in the board meeting that you wanna progress. And then again, that vote that shows up in the minutes that this person has the authority to sign. Financial statements. Now, you may be tax exempt, but you still have filings and reports and financial statements. Anything and everything that you have will be helpful. Um, typically, the ask and credit is tighter these days than it used to be. Um, COVID spooked a lot of banks and lenders and investors in a lot of ways, and amongst other things from going way back. So the last three years of financial statements, have those organized and at the ready. So you can just email them in a package. Um, if you've, they're reviewed is okay. Yeah, you know, CPA, uh, CPA audited or compiled is even better. Last three years, tax returns or statements, I mentioned that already. I put it into this category, but 12 months of electric bills, not your spreadsheet where accounting may have put in what your costs are, but the actual electric bills, this is gonna help your providers make sure that they're targeting savings for you and also look at your rate structures and some other complex things, which I'm sure people after me are gonna discuss even more. If you have any kind of recent credit rating or have been approved for other things, share those, tell the story. Um, that's part of kind of credit review. Also, now you get a little bit into the sort of the physical, um, if you have loans or liens on the property, someone else has rights, um, we'll wanna know about those. Uh, 
any kind of security interest in the property. If, you, if it's a leased property, is there a landlord? Are there records of that ownership? We can pull those from the county. Some is public record, but you might have some more detail. If solar is going to go on the roof, how old is that roof? Is it still under warranty? Do you have that warranty paperwork? We're going to want to keep that warranty in place. We don't want to avoid that warranty. Um, any other easements, if solar is going on the ground or in the parking lot, there may be water lines or uh, electrical easements by other parties. These, All of these things will help a lot to set the stage for a successful project. Um, again, with the power purchase agreement, then there's a, a bunch more steps. You get credit review, you pass credit muster. Sometimes then there's a designer, a separate contractor will do some design and engineering and model the size. They'll put a price tag on that system. Then that'll come back to us and we can look what our financing offer is. Obviously a financing company can't answer the question of if you were buying a car, how much is my payment until we know how much the car costs? So there, there's a bunch of attributes to come to later on. Um, additionally, then we'll start to dive into the details. Um, we may end up in a, some kind of a term sheet offer. And the power purchase agreement, as Jeff highlighted, the beauty of that is all the onus, responsibility, operational uptime, um, maintenance, repairs, insurance, it's all on us. And the obligation of the nonprofit is only to pay for the electricity that we deliver, which hopefully will be less than what you're stuck paying the utility now on a kilowatt hour basis. There are some gaming with rate switches in certain areas and some of that. Now, I will be honest and say small systems like Jeff described at Har Hashem these days are pretty hard to do a power purchase agreement for. The overhead burden of all of those financing mechanisms to utilize that investment tax credit and the depreciation is sort of outweighed by all the things that need to happen behind the scenes. So we will always look at every project, but it might be that we are not the perfect party to help if your project is small, 150 to $300,000 range. Larger than that gets easier and easier and easier. You may not need that. There are other options that the next speakers are also going to talk about. But I don't want you to rule out kind of self-financing, you know, with a typical business loan and fundraising. I always had this vision, and I've helped a few other organizations of faith go solar only by conversation. We didn't actually end up doing business together because I couldn't help them enough. But they did a, an image on an A-frame easel that they put in the lobby with a picture of the roof with all the solar panels on it and asked people with a marker to make a pledge, color solar panel blue. And that panel pledge was, let's say $300. It was tangible for the congregation and they raised most of the money they needed. And then they got a small business home with the bank they regularly worked with um, for the Name. Don't rule that out. That can work very well. Also, look into all the rebates and grants that are available. Your solar provider, your installer that we would contract with, but you'll want to work with, will tell you a lot of that, but look it up yourself too. And I think probably the biggest thing that was mentioned earlier too that is critical, an internal champion or a couple, maybe a small team. It's, you know, your nonprofits, many of the board and others are volunteers. See who's passionate about this. Give them some authority to do the research. And it's going to take a little legwork and research, but your project can be successful. Don't be stuck with one method of financing. There are multiples and ask the hard questions and good partners will give you the answers in truth. And with that, I will pass the torch. Thank you, Nick. Welcome. So next up we have Heath with McKinistry. Great, hi everybody. My name is Heath McKay. I'm the Director of Project Development for McKinstry. Uh, and I do have some slides if you wanna um, pull those up. 
Is this no, that's not, not that's your not presentation, mine. Heath? Okay. I know that project though. <laughs> yeah, starting on slide nine. There you are. Great. So, um, you know, both Jeff and Nick talked about project finance. I was going to take a bit of a different tact with discussing just, you know, energy development in general from a tactical standpoint, types of projects, uh, and some of the key considerations you may have when you want to consider developing a project. Uh, and really, what is <clears throat> a solar PV system? It's an asset. Um, uh, either if it's a, a SSA, PPA, you know, um, Nick's group, they're buying an asset um, and an asset needs to perform. Same thing if you're a, an organization or a congregation and you want to buy a solar PV system, it's an asset to be used to, to reduce your operating costs. And it's important to understand what that asset really looks like and, and could potentially be to have realistic expectations. So um, next slide. <clears throat> Again, uh, Heath McKay, Director of Project Development for McKinstry. McKinstry is a uh, a national energy services company. We focus on both efficiency as well as renewable energy uh, across um, 17 states. We have 25 offices, uh, over 2,200 employees across the US with really the sole mission of the next slide is to make every building we touch more efficient. Um, you know, we, we have a climate crisis that we're trying to address right now. And a key way to do that is the, the built environment in particular, if you move to the next slide, it is incredibly wasteful. Uh, over half of the energy in buildings is wasted. Over half of the labor of construction is wasted. Uh, construction is one of the few industries in the last 30 years that has not got more efficient, like everything else in the world. And we're striving to make it more efficient and, and um, um, reduce the overall impact of construction and the built environment on, uh, on our climate. So next slide, please. Uh, when looking at uh, successful PV development, recognize it's a multi-stage process. Um, you don't just go to Home Depot, pick up some solar modules and have somebody install them next week. Uh, it is a multi-stage process. Uh, with lots of different things. There's the, you know, the first stage is, is, is due diligence, understanding what is possible from a viability standpoint, what your options are for installing a solar PV system, what are the local policies and considerations. Uh, then you move into the engineering and design phase, you know, really ensuring that the system is going to um, be approved by the permitting jurisdictions um, and all those types of approvals you need to actually move a project forward. Uh, and then into construction and commissioning, you know, in particular for uh, faith-based organizations and nonprofits, you know, you're, you're operating a facility that, you know, people are going in and out of, at least uh, moving forward, maybe not last year, but, uh, you know, this is a construction project and can be a fairly complicated construction project. It needs to be integrated into your overall uh, plan for how you're going to operate for your facility while the, the contractor is out on site. And then certainly long-term operations and maintenance. You know, like I said before, this is an asset that um, you, know, you should care for to ensure that it is operating efficiently and effectively over the 30-year life cycle. Um, PV systems are 30-year assets, and so you should really look at them you know, in that context to make sure your investment uh, pays for itself over time. So next slide. So key considerations um, when, you know, starting your journey with trying to figure out what you can do from, from a renewable energy standpoint, hey, what do you have climate action objectives? You know, Jeff mentioned, you know, certainly financial criteria is important, but, you know, if there's overall driving sustainability reasons or climate action goals, you know, that's really important to understand and use that as a driving force. What sort of federal and state incentives are out there? Um, a lot of the incentives that are out there you know, are not tax-based, especially locally in Excel territory or with the Boulder County programs. It's not based on whether or not you can take the tax credit that so you're eligible for. Certainly on the federal level with the investment tax credit, while that's great if you're, you can take advantage of it, uh, it shouldn't be a, a, a non-starter for tax exempt organizations. You know, one of the, um, I've done a lot of PPA projects. I've done a lot of work with Nick. You know, it, it can be a really great solution, um, but going down the route of partnering for a 20 year agreement or 25 year agreement to leverage that tax credit uh, may not be the best choice for your organization. So really important to understand what your options are and then look at them from a financial standpoint of what's the best return on my investment over the 30 year life cycle. 
Um, so two very different, you know, lots of different options for, for finance. Uh, utility policy and rates. Uh, you know, raise your hand if you love reading rate sheets for the, with the utility. Uh, I'm going to take my hand down because I hate it, but I have to do it. Um, devil's in the details with how you really determine what is the value of the project that you have on your roof or on your building. Uh, moving on, technical viability. Um, Nick mentioned a few things. Structurally, uh, can the roof handle the system? Um, from a from an electrical infrastructure standpoint, can we interconnect the PV array? Really key technical viability criteria you want to get on early. Um, and then so size of the project and portfolio, as Nick mentioned, the bigger the project, the better your options are going to be from project finance. You know, strictly, you know, business, right? Economies of scale really make a big difference in how you um, can drive that or drive the value of a project for your for your organization. Understanding your financial criteria, what makes a good deal for you, and being completely upfront and going into this with clear criteria, really what you want to see happen. Uh, you never want to go down a long road only to find out, hey, this isn't going to work for us, for our organization. You know, understand what that might look like early. I mean, what does a yes mean to you? And then system types and production, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second. And then, like I said, the system ownership piece is a really critical component of um, to understand as you move forward, what is your preference? Um, what are the pros and cons of third-party ownership versus direct ownership? And what are the economic values and opportunities for both of those? So next slide. So when looking, I'm gonna do a quick summary of the sort of the three primary types of projects that we do in the commercial and industrial space. Uh, ballast at rooftop systems. Uh, this is a project that I did with Solaris on the Colorado State University campus a few years ago. So flat roof systems, you know, most common flat roof type of project, you know, um, it's the lowest, it's one of the lowest cost installations and has really good production. And so you think of, hey, how much money am I putting in and how much am I getting out of energy? That's a really cool, great thing to understand and where and ballast at rooftop systems, you really allowed to do that. Uh, these projects will not affect a warranty for the most part. Um, there is certainly due diligence that needs to be done with the roofing manufacturer, but for the most part, it's just fine. And easy permitting. So these types of projects can move forward pretty quickly. Next slide, please. Second are ground mount systems. Now, not every organization has ground available around their facility, but if you do, um, ground mount systems are a great way to go. They, at scale, they are, are lower cost than roof mount systems. They have better production. So again, low cost and even better production really impacts your financial performance of the asset. Uh, highly visible, where rooftop systems often are not visible. Um, ground mount systems is that, that visible representation of your commitment to climate action or sustainability for organizations. So it can be a really great teaching tool as well as a statement for what you're trying to accomplish as an organization. Now, they, they do have longer permitting and there's different land development things that we need to work through, um, planning and zoning typically, um, but with a good site, you know, ground mount can be a really great choice for you to consider. And then moving on to the next slide, uh, solar canopies. Um, you know, we get a lot of um, calls about canopy systems. You know, we do a lot of them. They are fantastic. Uh, however, uh, a couple key things to understand. Yes, highly visible, really good production, a bit better than rooftop systems for the most part, but they're higher cost. You know, you're essentially building a superstructure or a structure within your parking lot um, that simply costs more. Now, how does that impact you? It impacts if you're going to own the asset, it's going to be a longer payback. But if you're looking for a third party ownership PPA model where you're say we have to save off our, off our utility bills with a PPA, you're going to have a really hard time doing that with a canopy. Now, uh, unless you're at scale or there's some other incentives out there to help drive down the cost or you value the visibility or shade it covered parking and put a dollar figure to it, which some organizations do, can really help uh, sort of drive the reason for doing a solar canopy system. Uh, they, another cool thing is that we're doing a lot of EV charging, you know, electrification of the, 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 of the vehicle fleet out there. You know, canopies are a great place to put EV charging stations um, and incorporate the, that into the overall project. And then the, the next side, the last slide I have is when you're looking at 
um, the various options you have, it's important to understand this, right? So when looking at economics, which a lot of things get driven by economics, understanding where you may be able to achieve your financial goals for a project, ground mounts, lowest, lower, low cost, best economic value, rooftop, low cost, good economic value. They don't produce as much as a ground mount. That's why it's slightly uh, less better economic value than a ground project. And then canopy, much higher cost, can have good economic value, but it's not going to compare um, necessarily to a ground mount project. So key thing to do is target the right project for success for you. Um, rooftop and ground mount will provide the best economic value. Um, keeping in mind that canopy installations you know, do have a higher cost, but can increase some of that can increase system capacity so you offset more and have those important intangibles that you can't get from ground mount solar or rooftop projects. So there's a 10 minutes of PV 101 of project development. So for that, I'll, I'll pass it on, I think, to, to Tom. Thank you, Heath. Great, Amber, is that, is that me? Am I up next? Great, good. Hi, everyone, I'm yes. Tom Hardy and uh, mm -hmm. I am from Boulder County, um, uh, the program for Partners for a Clean Environment. We're a program of the Office of Sustainability and we're funded um, primarily through the uh, sustainability uh, tax revenue. Um, we um, work uh, both in, inside the city of Boulder and, and in, throughout the greater county of Boulder. And I just wanna share with you today um, some of the incentives that we offer, uh, you know, regardless of which uh, financial mechanism a nonprofit may be choosing, we can certainly, you know, help offset some of the costs through our rebates and grants. So I'm gonna talk about these three briefly today um, and also share with you, I know that um, uh, early in the call, Jeff mentioned the importance of, of doing the, uh, the efficiency piece first. And so, you know, if, if you've got a lot of inefficient HVAC equipment and, uh, and lighting, you know, there, there's some things you can do to reduce your uh, energy demand before you're even uh, pursuing, pursuing solar to, to power that, that equipment. And so um, PACE certainly can help with that in addition to uh, supporting you through a solar project and, and providing some incentives. So I'll talk briefly though today just about the solar incentives for nonprofits and, and uh, welcome any questions you might have about the other piece as well. So uh, there are three components of, of uh, incentives for nonprofits to install solar. I'm talking about our standard PACE rebate, which is uh, not limited to nonprofits, uh, but that's, that's uh, for any commercial application of a solar, solar project. Uh, the nonprofit solar equity grant, which is a countywide opportunity for nonprofits who have a mission that focuses on uh, supporting uh, low-income families and individuals. Um, and then third, the City of Bowler Solar Grant, uh, which is now administered through uh, our program at the county. Uh, the city uh, provides funding to nonprofits um, for further, further offsets. So all of these can potentially be combined for up to $55,000 worth of funding on a solar project. Um, each one has its own calculation of how, uh, how, how we um, fund those, those rebates and grants. And I'll, I'll walk through those briefly here. So starting with the, our standard uh, PACE solar rebate, uh, PACE again is the acronym for Partners for a Clean Environment. You'll hear, um, I think a little bit later in the presentation about um, a different PACE. And so there is a distinction um, that we'll get to there. But in any case, our program has a standard solar rebate for any uh, business or for-profit or nonprofit business or organization that is installing solar. And basically it's a, a dollar a watt um, up to $15,000 uh, to apply to your uh, to, as a rebate against the cost of your project. Um, again, this uh, covers for-profit and non-profit businesses, and um, we uh, do have some limits and caps on each of these. So this can cover up to 50% of project costs uh, when you're uh, combined with uh, any IDC credit that you might be getting or other incentives. So let's move on to the second piece, Amber. Thank you. The nonprofit solar equity grant again is available to nonprofits only throughout the county who have a mission that serves low income individuals and families. So this is um, a way that our program has found to um, ad address, uh, you know, a, um, equity and inclusion component to uh, providing renewable energy to 
uh, low-income individuals and families. And so nonprofits that are serving those folks are available or are excuse me, are eligible for an additional $5,000 grant against their project, which can be combined with um, the first component I talked about and potentially the next. And then thirdly, for nonprofits who are located within the city of Boulder, uh, the city funds a, a solar grant as well that will cover an additional 80 cents per watt, up to $35,000, um, uh, and up to 50%, again, of the project costs. Um, this is available to any type of nonprofit. M mission mission of the nonprofit is not um, uh, is not a, a determining criteria, um, but any nonprofit is available as well as um, low and moderate income housing projects. Uh, so, so multifamily housing that uh, that meets income that serves income qualified individuals is also eligible for this one. So again, this is just a quick overview of the three. Amber, if you want to advance, um, there's a table on our website that kind of walks through this. The, um, uh, the basic um, cap on these is that no, uh, no one of these three can exceed 50% of the project total project costs when combined with any other incentives that uh, you may be getting, may or may not be getting with an income tax credit. Um, but combined can cover up to 70% of the total project cost. So you could get a pay solar rebate, uh, a nonprofit solar equity grant and a city of Boulder grant and cover up to 70% of your project cost or, or a max dollar amount of $55,000. So um, I know that's a lot of numbers that I'm throwing at you, but just making you aware of it certainly can walk anybody through that. And this information is available on our website. Um, Amber, if you want to advance it again, just I'm not going to read through the general all of the eligibility requirements, but just a few things to keep in mind. Typically, we are um, providing incentives to uh, uh, folks and organizations who own their property, but we'll also consider uh, applicants who lease their property and have some uh, longer term lease terms remaining, maybe an option to renew some things like that. So um, just a kind of a, a soft eligibility requirement there. Um, we, we do have a certain uh, uh, performance standard on the equipment that's chosen. So we make sure we work with your contractor to be sure that they're installing modules and inverters that um, uh, meet, meet certain efficiency standards. Um, some warranty related inf information. Uh, this is only for new systems um, and the project has to be installed on the site, whether it's a ground mount system or rooftop system, it needs to be uh, installed on the site. Um, we're going to work with you to uh, really look at your overall sustainability uh, approach as part of this. It's just uh, uh, just something that we like to provide as a service. Um, and we uh, also need to mention that we typically don't uh, rebate or provide grants for projects where solar is required by building code. Um, and so if it's if it's something that um, you're a new build that uh, particularly in the city of Boulder requires solar as part of, of the building code, then um, then we don't offer our grants and rebates for those. Move forward one more time, Amber, please. Great. Uh, just something to keep in mind, we do not administer this piece, but the city of Boulder does offer a tax rebate um, on the uh, uh, sales and use tax paid on the materials and permits. Um, there's a way to apply for that through the city of Boulder website. So we'll help you not forget about that piece. And then lastly, just a few things to be really aware of if you're interested in these incentives through the city and county, really important. Uh, these funds are first come first serve. They don't always last all year long. So it's important to um, you know, uh, check in with us and see if funds are still available. They do run out from time to time. Um, projects have to be completed within the calendar year of approval. And so uh, if you're getting a late, uh, late start in the year, then it may be that you, you defer your project just to the next year when, when funds renew again and uh, you can get the, the, the work, your, your installer can get the work done. And then uh, just really, really important to understand that we, we don't do any retroactive approvals and rebates and grants. Everything has to be uh, reserved and approved in advance before equipment is, is installed. And so don't, don't wait to reach out to us. Let us be part of the process, um, regardless of which you know, funding strategy you're using through a PPA or self-funding or through your finance by your local bank. It's really important to get us involved earlier in the process so that you don't miss the opportunity to take advantage of some of these great incentives. 
And if you have any questions about that, certainly uh, check our, our website at pacepartners.com and, and email us. We can, we can uh, walk you through any questions that you have. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. And now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Thomas as our last presenter today. Good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk to you about uh, both existing and potentially uh, change, potential changes to the legal landscape associated with taking advantage of the uh, ITC. Uh, the first slide is just a little bit about me. I've been in the energy industry for over 30 years. I'm a licensed attorney in Colorado and uh, registered to uh, work in California as well. Uh, I left Colorado about 15 years ago and just returned about six months ago. So I'm really pleased to get back involved with the Colorado uh, Solar and Storage Association and other opportunities here. In those 15 years, I worked in New England installing uh, large scale commercial operations in up and down the East Coast, everywhere from uh, South and North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, New Hampshire and then moved out to California where I also worked on installing a number of systems out there. Uh, my last big effort was uh, 37 systems in Illinois, all for schools under the um, Illinois uh, solar legislation called the IPA. Uh, so I've got lots of experience in this. I also worked in oil and gas. Uh, it's, I've worked in both material sciences and in uh, structuring and financing uh, lots of large scale systems. Uh, you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I think, as you know, though I'm going to reiterate this for uh, basic uh, ITC benefit, the ITC is a tax credit that can be claimed on federal corporate income tax for the cost of solar photovoltaics and other things uh, that has been uh, placed in service during a certain tax year. Uh, as you know, uh, for the most part, the ITC is not available to schools, municipal utilities, municipal government agencies or charities may not claim the ITC uh, because of um, the, the tax code 26 USC 48. Uh, and so you have to do a workaround of some sort, which is typically called either third party ownership through a PPA or through various uh, specialty lending programs. So at the top of the first slide, I might add that this, the problem is enormous because uh, there are a, approximately 380,000 churches in the United States. There are, uh, I think it's something, let me just get my number here, uh, five, 356,000 government buildings and there are 140,000 public schools in the United States. So there are ways to find a, a TPO or third party ownership for these. Uh, but you really don't have an ITC option other than a cash purchase through a reserve capital account or a donor program. I think Nick mentioned that. Uh, and so I think um, uh, there's, there's some difficulties with those. I have done them. Uh, the latest one I did, which was, well, not latest, but I am currently doing the appraisal and buyout portion, and I do all the contracting for these sorts of things uh, with a um, nonprofit organization in Ukiah, California called the City of 10,000 Buddhas. Uh, they used a donor program strategy and are now at the point to convert back to, they have returned all of the investment of the donors to them and are now in the uh, option of converting that system, 451 KW system, back to the church itself. Uh, so as have been uh, mentioned in the previous uh, present presentations, third party ownership is the most common way. There is a, uh, the standard way is a power purchase agreement. I'm going to introduce you to a new uh, type of uh, TPO ownership that I think you'll be interested in learning about. There are also specialty lenders uh, and uh, they are, they are uh, directly um, tasked with uh, helping nonprofit organizations uh, borrow money. Uh, and there are some issues associated with that. And there are also property assessed clean energy. This is where uh, Tom referred to as the other PACE, uh, property assessed clean energy loans. 
Uh, you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, part of the problem with PPAs, and I think Nick mentioned this, and I think also Jeff mentioned this at the top of the hour, they're difficult to install for systems that are under one megawatt in size. And it's uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there is uh, costs associated with that, the disproportionate setup costs associated with drafting and reviewing a PPA with the lease agreement for the site, whether it's ground-based or site or uh, rooftop and other things that make it difficult for the ITC lender uh, to pool a significant number of systems to attract an ITC lender. In our experience, typically that's around $15 million. And so one megawatt system is going to be far insufficient for an ITC lender uh, to do that. In addition, your credit must be strong and uh, I don't know of a lot of schools and churches that have got exceptionally strong credit, but uh, th that can be pooled and thus the credit qualifications can slide down the scale a little bit, but there are issues associated with, uh, with a PPA. With specialty lenders, there's always interest you're gonna pay. And um, that also is gonna be based on credit worthiness. There are the same disproportionate setup costs. And if PACE is added, then you're going to have uh, liens on the property. Uh, and so you've got some issues associated with whether or not you're on a leased space versus one that has still got a mortgage associated with it. And with PACE as an added um, lien on that property, you're gonna have to get uh, some sort of um, subordination or non-disturbance agreement in place, which is an, also an added cost from the primary mortgager. Uh, so also you have to understand that with both specialty lenders and PPAs, you will not become the owner till a minimum of six years in order to avoid recapture and many PPA organizations, lenders want to hold the asset for the lifetime of the solar system, which is uh, 20 to 30 years uh, easily. 20 is the, sort of the minimum, but 30 I've even seen 40 year uh, PPAs. Next slide, please. So um, your options, uh, just to go back a little bit, are the power purchase agreement, their operating le leases, which are a common financial in instrument that we use to acquire expensive equipment, such as vehicles and computing equipment and machinery. Uh, however, due to the tax code, lessors are unable to recapture the ITC. Then there are the three types of loans, specialty lenders, PACE, and, and also crowd lending or donor strategies. I'd like to introduce you to a new program that I have been developing over the last few years, and it is not new, Heath will tell you this, as a large-scale energy services provider, his slides went to the heart of the issue, which is, is there a way that we can combine the direct sale of electricity only under a power purchase agreement, wherein the ITC lender and the uh, owner of the system take advantage of all of the environmental attributes, uh, and there are many of them. Uh, there are both uh, environmental management and then there are like recs in certain states, rebates in other states like Illinois. But there are also in New York, there's something called the VEDER system, which is the value of distributed energy resources. And what that does is it provides a way for the system itself, especially if it has a solar storage component to take advantage of certain um, ben benefits associated with delivering the power when most needed by the grid for such things such as um, grid stress or black start or uh, brownout situations. So uh, there is something called the energy services agreement. And I know that Heath has probably done these for large scale companies. And if you look it up on the website, you'll see that people like Siemens and other uh, Large organizations are helping people like Google manage the plethora of all of their energy systems. Can this be driven down to a small tax exempt entity? Uh, uh, in my opinion, the answer is yes. So you could go to the next slide. So the scenario that generated the first ESA that I did, and in this form, it was a prepaid energy services agreement or a partially prepaid energy service agreement. In this case, the NPO, which was a church, had enough money to buy the system. 
but wish to maintain their capital and operational reserves for other things, paving their parking lot or doing uh, remote programming or taking kids on field trips, those sorts of things. So the developer financed a solar and storage system, which included energy management, that is grid and market services like the VEDER, energy efficiency assessments and installations like better lighting and better uh, improved energy efficiency mechanisms and building improvements. In exchange for the energy services agreement, he offered a 12% discount to the estimated purchase price of the system and the total cost of service fees and power generated, which was then calculated as a flat rate. The NPO then prepaid a certain percentage of the total cost. The developer installed the system at their expense, calculated the remaining cost of the service agreement, which was the dollars prepaid, excuse the typo there, the dollars prepaid, less 15%, and then retained the benefit of the ITC. At the end of year six, the NPO has paid for the system with the 15% remainder, and that is where the less 15% comes in, applied to the fair market value of the system at the NPO's exercise of its option to purchase, uh, which is, was year six as agreed. Uh, by the way, this is uh, tax year six, not calendar year six, as when an investor comes in, whether it's a developer or an investor or lender, they uh, take advantage of the PPA and the ITC in the first taxable year after the system is placed in service. So they have the need to go for six uh, taxable years. Uh, next slide, please. Slide, please. So um, in this case, the requirements for an ESA are, there are some uh, requirements that go into the contract. And I have modified PPAs to act as energy services agreements. Uh, and so uh, the host customer contractually, a uh, contract is sufficiently shorter than the useful life of the equipment, which as we mentioned is 30 to 40 years. The host customer cannot bear any of the risk if the value of the property declines, that is the developer or lender's uh, risk that they bear. Um, the host customer should not benefit from any appreciation of the value of the property or the asset. Likely uh, also the host customer should not bear any changes in the operating costs of the equipment. So the developer uh, sets up an O&M agreement and he is the one that's going out to um, make changes or modifications to the system. We had one system on a nonprofit in California where it was on a golf course. And unfortunately, uh, there's a couple of people that sliced the ball and uh, we had a number of panels damaged simply by golf ball strikes, which will render a panel inoperable and you've got to swap those out. Uh, so as the owner of the property, the developer should bear the risk of the damage or loss with respect to the property and not the host customer. Next slide, please. And Thomas, just a time check. We're running a little over. I think I have two slides. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, and I'm sorry, this is a complex thing and it involves things. So if you can, uh, the advantages of, there's no project or LLC required. The developer can create a project company if desired. Development finances, the developer finances the equipment if required at less than market value. So he can do a, a, an operational or equipment financing the tax exempt entity directly benefits from the ITC uh, or indirectly benefits. There's a standardized ESA contract which minimizes cost and the host does not bear the risk of operations. So if you can just jump to the next slide. Uh, if you'd like more information on this, there was uh, issues with third party ownership, which will I, I won't address, but if you'd like more information on this, I am a contracts drafter. so. Even if a company comes in to finance your system, my job is to review those and make those for uh, best uh, for, the, uh, for the client itself. So there's my information for later contact. So I'll, I'll leave it with that and pass it back to you, Ambra. Thank you very much. Amber, you're on mute.
Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Thank you all for presenting such great information today. I felt like it was so helpful. I learned so much just hearing everybody present as well. So um, I hope that everybody else got as much out of it as I did. And um, it looks like we are a little over time. So if you can stay for questions, otherwise, if you do have questions and you want to email me, um, my email is a Sutherlin, S-U-T-H-E-R-L-I-N at bouldercounty.org. And I'll make sure that we get your questions answered. Other than that, I will, if you can stay, we'll turn it over to the chat for questions. Um, question for Nick. Opportunities of SB 21261, 200% rule and virtual net metering for projects converting church parking lots to community solar gardens, SG, SCG, question mark? Well, that's a lengthy one. A little bit of a disclaimer. I was involved in some of the back and forth in the drafting of the bill and the end negotiations, but I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing exactly as it was signed. And uh, it's kind of crazy the way they do things at the Capitol sometimes. The general feel of that specific topic within SB 21261 is you can always do a community solar project um, on property and then have subscribers elsewhere. So that's one program separate. What was in some of the earlier drafts of 21261 was the ability to aggregate meters and I believe what came out in the final product was an owner of a campus kind of environment that's separate meters and separate buildings and separate parcels. Normally you couldn't transmit that electricity that you generated across property lines to power someone else. But this allowed some sort of virtual net metering for um, a similar owner or same named owners would work well, again, for a campus kind of scenario or even some scattered around town, but if all the meters were under the same name or same entity name, that was kind of the intention. I think that's what fleshed out in the end, uh, but it's worth a full read. It's not full-blown open virtual net metering like we would all love. Uh, the utilities had a heart attack with that and they still do every time we propose it. Um, so it's somewhere in between. Great, thanks Nick. And another question for you, are you self-funding the solar projects you install and taking the ITC directly or using third-party finance? We do a little bit of both. Um, though, if you think about it logically, you have to have a very large piggy bank to finance all the projects internally and absorb all the tax credits and depreciation. So our pool of investors is a little selective we, we do both. Some projects we develop, then keep um, self-fund and take tax credits internally and depreciation benefits. And others, we bring in external partners. Um, we have those relationships already established and this sort of can play matchmaker as need be when necessary. Great, thank you. And we have a question for the panel. Is there a deep energy retrofit guide for commercial buildings? Um, including local resources, we are investigating just transition and post-COVID job creation in building efficiency and electrification, um, setting up vocational training, et cetera. Does anybody want to take that one? I popped an answer with a link into the chat. I don't want to be the only one who answers questions, <laughs> but NREL is a great resource for all kinds of white papers like that. That link in the chat will get you to the commercial building page. And then there's some resources and white papers and lots of downloads there. I might add, add, I might add to that. Um, Secretary of Energy Granholm will be announcing, I think, tomorrow uh, a new program that is based off of the um, RPE or Department of Energy's Orange Button program. Uh, which will have a series of uh, strategies in order to do uh, assessments, and it will also include some energy uh, efficiency assessments. Great, thank you. Um, question for, I believe this is Tom Hardy. Does work within the city help the city reach its um, 100 megawatt uh, renewable goals, and does that increase their subsidies per two projects? 
Hey, thanks. Thanks for the question, Dave. I don't know how commercial solar projects um, are tied to the to the city's 100 megawatt goals, but I will I'll follow follow up on that with you uh, when I get an answer. In terms of how it affects uh, their subsidies to projects, um, the the parameters and the subsidies to projects are on a fixed uh, criteria, and so. Um, uh, all of our projects are uh, that we're administering for the city of Boulder are funded at the same level, so at 80 cents per watt. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, and then another question for the panel: For community solar gardens, can the developer add up to 200 percent loads of its subscribers to justify a large capacity array? Yeah, I can answer that question. Maybe. So, I mean, uh, the way community solar works is that the, there's multiple subscribers that are part of the community solar garden and no more, and a single entity can take no more than 40% of the generation of any single CSG. And so, you know, that that's more of a limitating, limitating factor. Um, you do, you know, currently the rule for sizing a subscribe description to a CSG is 120%. Uh, the new legislation that passed is going to increase that to 200% um, of, of your load to get to, so you'll be able to do more and therefore justify a larger subscription for a particular account. Thanks, Heath. And then a couple last minute questions for Nick. Um, could a 75 to 100 kW system on seven buildings make sense? This is for an 18 unit housing complex in the Western Slope as part of a Habitat for Humanity project. Interesting, I did get some highlights to that project. So <laughs> that's not a stranger to me. Um, it's very challenging for the kind of financing that I can offer. That's the hard part. Um, can it work? It could work, but I think it would need a sizable um, prepayment or kind of deposit to go with it to drive down that starting PPA rate to add or below what the kilowatt hour cost is there, um, which is pretty cheap. So it's a hard target to hit. If money was no object, of course, anything is possible. But I don't like to advise things that I wouldn't find fiscally responsible myself. So that's the challenge therein. Um, the, the burden ends up, each site has to be looked at individually and it has a due diligence process and you know, legal costs and title searches and um, lots more. And when you add all those up into a project that size, it's a little bit hard to make that work at 75 to 100 kilowatts, even if it was a single site. So that project gets unfortunately handicapped. I'm happy to talk more about it and go into more depth and try and brainstorm on it. I don't think it's a good fit for what the PPA is. I, uh, and I'm just gonna add that I think under me that can be done. Uh, we're doing a similar project in California right now with seven systems. 137 kilowatts for a nonprofit organization under an ESA. So, uh, and since there's no real financing, is Nick's right? There's a prepaid component uh, to bring the cost down, but you don't have the financing component on the backside. So you can really there's some uh, there's some cost analysis that there can be done there. So, might look at that option. And just in addition onto that, could a homeowners association capture the ITC? As a nonprofit entity, I guess just regarding like a typical like a Habitat for Humanity type project, they should be able to under uh, under an ESA. They're always going to have a developer and a TPO interface in there, right? So because if it's a nonprofit organization, if the HOA is for profit, then they could uh, possibly do it there. And then just one last question before we depart. Um, brief, could um, brief, someone briefly share the use of member loans in the next or in the net zero energy renovation done at First Universalist Church in Denver in 2017? If anybody has that knowledge. Uh, 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 thanks, Amber. Uh, I can help with that. And 
I have a lot of friends on this call, so uh, it's great to see uh, all the work that uh, Nick has done and, and, and others. Um, in 2017 and 18, uh, I'm, I'm a, uh, a, a part of the church leadership at First the Universalist Church of Denver. And uh, in 2017, we embarked on a, a renovation. It resulted in a net zero carbon uh, facility with geothermal and solar. But uh, financing both of those were a big challenge, and uh, and we uh, partly because of my involvement in the industry with folks like Nick and others, um, I, I was uh, familiar with a lot of different uh, financing uh, mechanisms. We, we even talked to Solaris at the t at the time about a PPA. But one of the things we ended up doing that, that turned out to be clever, and I think it, it works uniquely in a church environment, uh, probably wouldn't work in any other environment, is that we ended up doing a, a low cost or what you might call impact loans by members. So we raised a chunk of the uh, funding for the geothermal and solar through contributions, which is normally what church members think about when they are giving to their church. But there was about 60% uh, that needed to be raised that we couldn't do with donations. And that ended up to be with one and a half percent member loans over 15 years. And it greatly changes the dynamic for a church member. Um, they normally think about just giving money and, and you know, larger givers think about the tax implications of that and so forth. But when a, uh, when a giver can make um, even a very low interest loan, they know that they're providing some impact. And then they also know that they're going to get paid back, even though it's a slow payback. So um, uh, I do PACE financing, uh, commercial PACE financing uh, for a living. And, uh, and, and it made much more sense at our church for us to do these low impact member loans. And it was a, it was a clever solution to solve uh, a problem in our case. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, John. It sounds like a very creative approach. So I appreciate, appreciate you sharing that. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. We have somebody else jumping on this uh, Zoom meeting <laughs> here soon. But I really appreciate your time and just great information today. Um, everybody was very knowledgeable. And certainly, if you have any additional questions, please reach out um, to anyone on the, the board here or, or reach out to me, and I can pass it along. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.